Today, actually, we would like to celebrate uh, the collaboration we had uh, with Professor Pizzi, Professor Ruta, uh, with uh, all the students that had been helping in the, uh, in the Italian pavilion competition that we had been doing, and uh, also with the construction of a part of that competition that at the beginning uh, seemed that could uh, arrive in Expo in uh, many little constructions, and at the end it was only one construction that finally could happen. Uh, and uh, we would do that, uh, but before I would like to explain a little bit some of the projects which led to this, uh, to this new competition. Of course, one of the important projects for uh, my new, uh, let's say, uh, life uh, in, in, the, in the studio uh, was this competition in Shanghai. It was a kind of a new life in a way because we have never been as, an architect, as architects in, uh, in, uh, in China. China was a kind of a dream place for me. It was a place where I was uh, traveling to when I was uh, 18. And I thought it was fascinating. It was a communist China, but it was still uh, very present, the history, very, very strong. So I, I had this kind of uh, incredible myth in my head. So when we did this uh, competition for the Spanish pavilion in Shanghai, my real hope was to be able to go to Shanghai. And of course, uh, an expo is always a way to, uh, to explain something in a kind of a very evident way. It's a, a building, but of six months life, a very uh, small life, but a lot of people looking at it. So it's a, it's a very compressed life. So uh, the occasion was to talk about something which I thought it was very beautiful, a fantastic craft, which maybe could be applied into buildings. And uh, this was the occasion to, to experiment that, to see if the handcraft, if working with wicker, something which usually in humanity was used uh, to, to make uh, small tools, could be used uh, for uh, this new Spanish pavilion. And uh, on top, this technique is a human technique which is used uh, not only in Spain and Italy and Europe, but also in China very much and is linking uh, the countryside with the city. So for this expo, which was, uh, the lemma was uh, better cities, better life, we thought that talking about uh, handmade uh, buildings would be a very nice uh, theme. And that's why we started to, to make images like this one, which were trying to imagine how a big building uh, handcrafted could exist. So we started with, uh, with models, with actually cardboard models, which were giving the idea of a sort of transparency. And when we won the competition, which we knew it was a competition very difficult to realize, we had never done before a building in Wicker, we realized that the, the structure, which was very, very, a very complex geometry, we were uh, making a, a a complex figure going round, uh, we thought that uh, the structure of metal would be the best one. And then the wicker on top of this structure would be like a sort of dress, which would cover this uh, very complex geometry, which was exactly shaped, exactly drawn by the, by the structure. So, how to do this dress? This was now the question. We had to, to realize it. We had to convince Spain that this was uh, really possible, uh, really easy. And we were looking at, uh, at our uh, most admired design uh, uh, dressmakers. So this is a, a fashion designer, is a Miyake, a very so mysterious dress, which is, uh, could be a, a sort of uh, animal, a sort of architecture, a sort of something. So we wanted our building to become a little like this, but we still didn't know how. And then we used the office, this was the office at the time, uh, it's still very much like this, it's changing, it's getting more full of stuff, but uh, we still have a lot of people working with hands, uh, making uh, things by hands, and by doing that, 
thinking, let's say, thinking in, uh, in making, so that we can have a kind of a immediate reaction. No? If someone is thinking about that and is doing this, then uh, you can go by and you say, oh, this is really fantastic, and you can imagine a, a facade which is maybe not only flat, but it's becoming sort of, uh, how do you say, with hairs or with uh, something coming out, you know, not defining a, a flat skin. And then you, you try in many more different ways how this skin which is not flat can, can be, how the panels could be uh, composed uh, together with them, how the curve of the panels could be. And we were experimenting in this moment with a little time because we had some months to study this, but then a little more pressed by the fact that we really had to give uh, working drawings and uh, the possibility to make this built and constructed uh, not only in, in Europe but in China. So these were really fantastic experiments and were a way to make us reassured that this could be done, this could be uh, beautiful, this could be something which we could explain to the, to the craft bands uh, in China and, and Spain, and, and we had a, a lot of that. And then at the end, this piece was the one that, among the many you have seen, was selected because we thought it was kind of very clever. First of all, we were imagining from that a dimension of two by one, which was a good dimension to move, and also a good dimension to, 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 to not to be too small and not too big. But also it had a special geometry, which is uh, maybe at the end coming from, from Gaudi, you know, this kind of, of roofs uh, which are done with, uh, with flat surfaces that then becomes curves. And, and this uh, special surface could be put together as if uh, they were like tiles. So this, this sort of dress could be composed by many panels which had a, a kind of an easy way to be built and were the same and then could be put together in a way which, uh, which uh, made the surface not being flat but being kind of more uh, three-dimensional, uh, more into space. So this panel was produced in Spain and we brought it in China. Then in China, uh, they had the duty to reproduce that, which was uh, the basic shape. And here are some images. Meanwhile, the building was uh, growing, and we were looking at the, at, the real, uh, at the real bones of the building in photographs from China. And here in the office, we had some uh, model bones, which were, we were uh, covering with this skin that we were trying in many different ways. We, we needed to be sure that this would work. Uh, of course, we have never done something like that. And we, we were very happy to have something very natural. And uh, the natural of that was, as we knew, in different colors. You can choose wicker in uh, more white or more brown, more black. And then we thought it would be a fantastic idea to have a kind of use of these different colors to draw letters, to draw a sort of big calligraphy which will be in the space, in the surface of the building and uh, which will be uh, part of the, of the wishes that the building would uh, give to the expo itself. So we were writing things like uh, uh, the woods, uh, the uh, trees, uh, Spain and China, our friends, uh, uh, the illumination of the universe, so very beautiful phrases. And then these phrases, these uh, words, Chinese words, were uh, put into, into the facade, enormously big, so that you were not able to read them completely. And we were hoping that the building was really working like a big wish to, to all the Expo, or maybe to all China. So this was, uh, this was our, our idea for this pavilion. As you see, the pavilion is, uh, is a very complex geometry, 
with the empty space in the center, the piazza, we were thinking about the Spanish piazza, and then uh, this uh, exhibition spaces, which were like interior piazzas, or the restaurant, which was also like uh, a, a very important space in the piazza. So uh, this was a moment where we were looking at the construction happening. Actually, we, we have never constructed in China. It was a sort of a, a emotion to see how, how this building was growing, how this natural material that we thought uh, would be the skin of the building will become uh, also the, uh, the scaffolding of the building itself, because uh, the scaffolding, most of it is done in bamboo. And, uh, and we were admiring this uh, big building growing uh, with figures that were always different week by week, uh, month by month. So this was the moment where we were looking at the building already with the structure, the, um, the metal structure, and a lot of bamboo, bamboo panels, very similar to the one then we were going to put in the facade. So very surprising no? to see how the bamboo was uh, really autochthonous, really there, uh, very common also in the world of the construction. And, and then uh, looking at the people, the people usually in China, they, uh, they nearly sleep in their, in their construction site. You know, they, they have a, a real big love for their construction site and a sense of belonging. So you were finding many of them sleeping in the site, living in the site, and some of them usually stay in the building, in the finished building, and live there. Uh, they become sort of, uh, of guardians. But in this moment, they were becoming, in front of the camera, sort of actors. You know, the beautiful actors, very, very real, of a moment which so quickly disappear because we are used to look at the photographs of the building when the buildings are, are finished, they are very clean, but we forget about uh, these important faces who are the uh, the real uh, makers of, uh, of this building, uh, of little pieces of it, little parts of it, and very humble, in a very humble way, they know that they will not be remembered. They, they very seldom will be seen again. So I think it's, a, it's really a pleasure to look at them, to be able to see at their face, to be able to see their skills, uh, their capacities, and their dedication while constructing this work, which was uh, then uh, in the expo. And also this of sleeping in, in the site, which, uh, which is something that I told you is very, very important. No? So these weaker panels were becoming important also before construction because they were like beds. Everybody was surprised, say, oh, they look like beds. And in fact, they were using it as beds. And here is the moment where, uh, where in China they were building this, uh, these prototypes which were coming from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Spain. They arrived in China in the north of Shanghai uh, in the Guangdong province and they were uh, rebuilt by something like 120, uh, uh, how do you say, artisans or craftsmen. They were usually doing uh, smaller things for the countryside, like baskets or things like that. And this was one of the first time they were working for a big building. And not only a normal building, but a building which would be very visible. So there was a sort of, of uh, uh, proud in their, in their working, no? For the first time, their handwork was becoming very important, was becoming protagonist was uh, used uh, to, to be seen by millions and millions of people. So these, at the end, were produced and transported these panels into, into the site. And little by little, they were put on, uh, on the facade, which a lot, with a lot of difficulties, I have to say. You know, because, for example, this piece, we had so many difficulties in, in designing it with a kind of a possibility for this piece to rotate 
because, because the geometry of the, of the facade is very complex. Here you have a flat one, but usually the rest is, is a very, very, very curved and very complex. So you need this, uh, this facade to, to really move, to really adapt on the surface. So these cables were, uh, were taken by these uh, uh, this, uh, substructures, and then on top of the cables, the panels were hanging, and they were hanging, as I were telling you, a little like tiles on the roof, one uh, a little on top of the other, so that at the end, this was the effect, like as if many beds, beds from the countryside, beds that were used by, by the workers to, to physically sleep, were hanging into the facade, were hanging on this very complex metal geometry, and we're becoming this new strange animal, which uh, at the end was uh, also surprising me and everybody who had been working in this project. Because I think when you do a project with a new material, what you don't know is really how it will be when you will, be, when you will finish that. No, you can make many tries, you can make many models, uh, many 3D, uh, but at the end, the reality is the reality. And, uh, and this was a kind of a beautiful surprise because we realized that this natural material was not only uh, visual, uh, visually uh, like the one we had been drawing, but also it's, uh, it, was, uh, it was interacting with, uh, with the sky, it was uh, smelling, for example, it was changing in the, in the humidity of the day, if it was uh, sunny, if it was not sunny. It was really reacting as if it was a kind of a natural surrounding. So in a way, I, I, I discovered that what we were doing in a place like an expo, which is very, very, uh, very unnatural, very artificial, we were trying to build a sort of natural environment, which was the skin, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, changing, adapting, as if uh, uh, a, a natural element, as if it was a plant or a, a piece of wood. So this was uh, the moment of the expo. It was a very special moment. Uh, the, the building was a little like a, a countryside mountain or a countryside uh, uh, tool, something very special. And the, in the inside, there was this transparency which we were thinking since the beginning, uh, a sort of, of uh, inside, outside, uh, that you could sense, no? You had this feeling that maybe the glass was not existing. The glass, in fact, exists and is there. But, but uh, you, you don't have the feeling that it exists, no? You, you think that you are maybe in a sort of, of hat, very protected, and the space inside was very fluid, very continuous, uh, not uh, interrupted, really. We, we designed this furniture so that we could have this a possibility of uh, interrupting the flux of the people, but maintain the continuity of the space. And, uh, and this was the inside with a big stairway, which was uh, indicating where the offices were and where the exhibition was. And the exhibition with this uh, magic piece by Isabelle Cochette, who is a film director, and instead of making a film inside the ro this room, she decided to have small films in, in, uh, in small bubbles here on the floor, and then have a gigantic Hollywood uh, uh, creature, like, uh, like the shark, you can say, you know, because uh, in Hollywood where they built the shark, it was a totally uh, movable and mechanic. And this enormous baby was also mechanic. It was moving the eyes, moving the, the head. If you were touching the skin, it was a little as if it was a human skin, but it was a little scary, you know, because it was six meters high, so it was a little impressive. And, and uh, in the night, this was becoming a sort of, of, of lamp, a kind of a, of a magical, uh, magical Chinese lamp. So this was the experience we had in, in the Expo in China. 
And from that experience, we were called to do some other little projects. No, we didn't know how China would react to this, uh, this building. We thought maybe not very well because it was not the aesthetic that we were seeing in, in Chinese cities. But in fact, we were asked to design a park in another expo, a garden expo. And uh, we wanted to do in this very small piece of garden a sort of labyrinth so you can multiply the spaces, you can make uh, many more uh, angles, many more spaces. And everything was uh, reminding that world that we were discovering of, uh, of handicraft, of uh, uh, bamboo, uh, wicker, and uh, these materials that usually are very used in China and, uh, and uh, especially in gardens. We also wanted a lot of birds, but as you can see, the birds were, were paper birds because uh, it was much, uh, much more playful. And uh, also we were asked to design uh, a, a strange uh, museum for a painter that we should have known before, but we didn't know. He's a painter which is considered the Picasso of China. He's called uh, Zhan Da Chen. I don't know if I pronounce well. I see some Chinese people here, but more or less. And he was born actually in, in a city in Sichuan, uh, in the north of China, near Chengdu. And uh, he was, uh, he was um, now, uh, let's say, remembered by the town because he escaped China in 49. So during some years, nobody wanted to remember him. But in this moment, they wanted to remember him as the Picasso of China. And then, uh, and then they called a Spanish architect. They say, you know, he was the Picasso of China. You are Spanish, so maybe this is a, a good possibility. Well, I'm not Spanish, I'm Italian, but never mind. Uh, I, I met him in this, uh, in this uh, statue, and it was very lovely to, to be together with this fascinating man, even if he was only in, in a piece of stone. And, and here we started to investigate how he was, what was his painting, uh, his life. He had an incredible life with many children, many wives. And uh, his paintings about uh, Chinese nature, very traditional, but at the end of his life, very, very special, very creative. And the moment when he met uh, Picasso in Côte d'Azur, and Picasso was uh, uh, making a present to him, this, uh, this drawing, which was a kind of a portrait of uh, Zander Chen by Pablo Picasso, done with, uh, with the brushes that Picasso had been giving him. And, and, and these are the, uh, the small drawings that we were using as sort of, uh, of plans in order to, to have a, a master plan in the uh, top of a hill for his future museum, which was looking a little like, uh, uh, like his painting. So the profiles of these pavilions that we wanted to, to do for uh, composing his museum were looking like uh, the figure that Zander Chen was, uh, was drawing. And these pavilions were organized uh, in a loose way on top of this uh, small mountain around uh, a, a tea house uh, built in a traditional way so that you can have a sort of, uh, of pavilions which are not interrupting the landscape. Uh, here you have very big trees and some of them are very near to the, to the pavilions themselves. The tea pavilion is kept and you have a sort of possibilities of going around and visiting different small exhibition inside the different pavilions. So we were, we were designing the pavilion in a kind of an open way. From this plan, you can see that uh, the inside of the, of, the, of the building is a sort of courtyard where you can create a Chinese garden and also the surrounding remains like the natural surroundings of the forest in, in the hill. And uh, this is uh, the, the, the building. What we are still missing about the building is what will go inside. In fact, uh, the city of Neijiang, which is wishing to celebrate Zanda Chen and to celebrate the fact that Zanda Chen 
was born there, they don't have any collection, right, Santa Chen. So they are still talking about uh, what will happen inside. But luckily, this man was absolutely creative. He was doing a lot of recipes, a lot of gardening, a lot of uh, invention of different things. He was not only painting in a wonderful way. He was always doing different things, entertaining friends, uh, making parties. So maybe this insides of this pavilion could tell the lateral story, the, the par part of the personalities of this artist, which were not celebrated yet in uh, normal museums. And I was very struck by the celebration of the opening, by the colorful uh, uh, celebration ritual. And uh, we think that this was a very beautiful moment and that because of this uh, happiness of the day of the first stone, probably the building will be a happy building. No? We, we really are learning that from the tradition of China. And this was a moment where we were meeting with uh, Yang Chen. She actually married a, a businessman in Madrid. And we invited them one night when the Neijang delegation was coming and visit uh, Spain. And we had actually a, a wonderful celebration with a lot of, of wine and a lot of campe, which is a very typical way of making friends in China. So now this is under construction. I'm uh, very worried because I look at this from a distance and uh, it's not so easy to control that because uh, usually we don't receive the, the, um, the contract to do, a, 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 how do you say, the site uh, following up. But we follow up uh, because we like, sometimes we go there, we make photographs, we have conversations with the city of Neijang and let's hope that this building will be really a happy building like the one we have seen in, in, the, in the moment we have seen in the celebration. And uh, a happy moment also somewhere else in, uh, in Europe, not in China anymore. This is Hamburg and this is a space where we are working since uh, maybe 14 years ago, a long, long time ago. We won a competition a long time ago in order to redesign the public spaces of this part of Hamburg and uh, reconvert from harbor into city. So you see why, no? The harbor now is enormous and we would like this little bit to become a city. So this was our starting point, realizing that the harbor in the past was uh, really not a place so defined as it is now. You have water, but in the same time you have a lot of places on the water where you can stand. So what we wanted to do was a little something like that, no? Some uh, beautiful space for people where you were mingling the water and the earth and you could have the possibility to enter very much into, into the water and having as much as possible the feeling of, of being near to this beautiful media which is, which is the water. And here it, it was also very possible to make this sort of, uh, of uh, mingling with, uh, with the water because here it was uh, a place where the city of Hamburg received a lot of bombs, so it was destroyed still since uh, 1945 and, uh, and we maintain the breakage of the wall uh, in order to transform that into a soft park. So it's uh, the only soft park in this, in this harbor site in a way is a thank to the bombs. No? So it's a way to change uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, how do you say, the sense of the things, no? bombs which are for destruction, at the end they could bring a sort of uh, well-being to the people. So this is uh, the harbor that we have been designing. It's a place with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of things happening, a lot of lights, a lot of stairs, a lot of bricks, a lot of pieces of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of drawings uh, on the bricks, on the floors, 
so that you can have entertainment. I think this is the main, uh, the main theme. No? You have to feel here very much entertained so that you get confused and uh, you forget that actually you are in Hamburg, which is a very cold uh, city, and you think for a little while that you are in a kind of a Mediterranean site, no? like uh, Barcelona. So more or less, sometimes this is happening. In uh, uh, sort of uh, little sunny days, you have a lot of people going in, uh, in the Hafen city in Hamburg and enjoying uh, going with a bicycle, walking, and being entertained by these many things which are happening and which are dedicated to different publics, to uh, people who are couples and want to walk by themselves, or the children, or people who would like to go to a restaurant and have, uh, and have good food. So you find a lot of, of different options in this public space. But most of all, you have this uh, uh, design public space, which is uh, really f giving a feeling of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, let's say, easiness, uh, family, so that the attraction to the people can become stronger and can make that a lot of people arrive on the site. So this is something that we like, actually. We, we like to investigate how you make a place uh, uh, attractive, how do you make a place uh, that makes people feel better, no? people feel happy. So for example, this experiment we did with, uh, uh, with the Spanish pavilion was, uh, was very useful, but of course it was very difficult to maintain the, that, that natural structure in time uh, and also the difficulties of the, of the public building, then the firemen. So we were experimenting in a possibility of doing this uh, sort of uh, um, weaker construction but with other materials which are fireproof, for example, which can be maintained in time and can be woven as if it was done by hand but half enough, no, with a robot who can try to weave this uh, as if it was done by, by human hands. So for example, in this case, it would be possible to substitute the, the panels in the Spanish pavilion with, uh, with uh, non-inflammable panels. And we had the possibility to go on with this thinking of weaving an architecture for other places and other competitions. For example, here we are in a competition in Paris, uh, a place which is, uh, we are looking at African uh, art because it's a place with a lot of African inhabitants, uh, people coming from different parts of the world, but uh, mainly from Africa, north and south. And, and we were trying to use uh, collages of uh, paintings of things that we found uh, uh, there in order to make the project which we, had, we were asked to do. This is uh, uh, the outskirts of uh, Paris, clichy Montfermeil. We had a big forest in nearby and here has to be a, a metro station, a subway station, and we were asked to participate to the competition in order to design that. So the situation was the one I was uh, telling you, uh, the outskirts of the city of Paris, outskirts uh, which were uh, not, very, uh, not very safe, not very, um, not very integrated with the city, and this became very, very clear during a series of riots which happened in 2005, and that we, we all know. After the riots, uh, the city of Paris decided to build this uh, big infrastructure around uh, the city center, which will be the Grand Paris, Metro, Grand Paris Metro project, and which will help in making this uh, peripheral place uh, more, uh, in, uh, more connected and then uh, less aggressive. So these were images of the place. Uh, some of them are from uh, 2005, some of them are from this artist called uh, Gérard, uh, 
uh, who, who was a European artist that, who at the beginning was just writing his name on, uh, on metro wagons, J.R., and this, uh, this is his name, let's say. But uh, then he developed his art and he was photographing the people of the place and then making gigantic photographs of the, their faces and their eyes so that he could hang these gigantic photographs on the streets and people could uh, see themselves, no? could take conscience of themselves. And apparently, in the same moment that Jayag was doing this uh, sort of art, uh, photographing people and hanging the, the images of the people in the place, then uh, the, the riots were happening. So as if maybe he was giving a sort of consciousness to the people that uh, something had to change. So Jayag now is uh, still working with the place. This is Le Bosquet, near the metro station we, we are designing. And he is uh, really working with people and with making art, which is kind of changing uh, this, uh, this place and making, making it become more conscious of itself and maybe for this reason better. So we are now working with all of that. We are now uh, into, into this project. Uh, we were also working with, uh, with uh, other artists who are doing, urban artists who are doing similar things. This is uh, Jorge Rodriguez Gerada. He comes from Cuba. He now lives in Spain. And uh, we had been collaborating with him with more than one project. And he's working with that, you know, with the idea of uh, making faces of people becoming big, uh, bigger gigantic, you know, as big as this one. This one is a, is a landscape, this is people, so you can see how big it is. And, and, and with this, making a kind of a, a big consciousness happening, uh, happening, something very, very uh, private, something very small, something very secret, becoming urban plan, become part of the, of the, of the life of everybody and very, very public. So we were using these uh, uh, images in order to design our, our, our piazza, our metro station. This metro station had to also be designed in the outside, not only in the inside. And, uh, and we were thinking about that material that you had been seen before, a material of a panel, which could be done in, in a new material nearly woven, but could make a sort of a pergola and also the inside of the, of, the, of the metro station itself. So we were studying how this panel could be, how this pergola could be, the colors of the place, the color of the people, and, uh, and these uh, um, uh, elements which could be repeated so that then you can weave one by one and put it together in order to make it a kind of a, of a big canopy or a big facade or a big place. These are images of uh, while we are working in the studio. We like very much to work uh, with hands and with uh, cardboard and with uh, small things which from, uh, from the beginning... Dieci minuti? Okay, and uh, uh, okay, you see from the hands they go and they become bigger and become other things. So they tell me that we have only 10 minutes, so we go very fast. This uh, project in Clichy Montfermeil uh, was, uh, was uh, dealing with that, with, uh, with this uh, piece which is a woven piece. And uh, the woven piece was in the, in the pergola and in the inside of the, of the building. So with this, we had uh, won the competition. And now we are dealing with uh, how to make it, a little like when we started the Spanish pavilion with the wicker panel. Now we have another thing to develop, a kind of a urban space, a space where the people could really feel better and, uh, and this piece of architecture had to try to, to make this, uh, this big effort. Uh, so now we can, we can go, because we only have 10 minutes and we would like to 
explain a little about uh, the Expo Milan. Maybe we can put uh, a video. I paesaggi italiani, tutti diversi, una natura trasformata dall'uomo. Da queste terre arrivano i cibi e i vini italiani, variati come il suo paesaggio. Ritagliando le fotografie aeree delle campagne di tutte le regioni d'Italia, abbiamo disegnato l'albero della vita, che farà da tappeto alle attività e all'esposizione del Padiglione Italia. La cupola emergente del Padiglione Italia è come un albero dell'energia e della sostenibilità. Indica da lontano la zona centrale dell'esposizione. Porta placche fotovoltaiche che provvedono all'energia dell'edificio, l'estrattore dell'aria interna alla cupola centrale e le necessarie spettacolari luci notturne alimentate dalla luce solare. Anche le facciate ricordano filari di cipressi o pioppi, uniti ma con aperture tra le foglie. ma anche le città fanno parte del paesaggio italiano e le città italiane vengono rappresentate magnificamente dalle loro cupole dal Pantheon dall'antica Roma a Brunelleschi a Firenze a Bramante, Bernini, Borromini, Nervi la cupola italiana potrebbe raccontare tutta la nostra storia ma nel nostro progetto le cupole non rappresentano solo lo splendore del passato italiano ma raccontano la potenzialità della cupola per il futuro. Continuando il cammino indicato dall'inventore Buckminster Fuller, qui sperimentiamo con le cupole come strutture sostenibili, che, oltre ad essere bellissime, utilizzano un minimo di materiali e ottimizzano una facilità costruttiva. Nel padiglione centrale la grande cupola attrae il pubblico ed ha un punto di riferimento spaziale necessario ad una splendida organizzazione degli spazi interni. La cupola è la più bella piazza coperta che si può immaginare. Questa cupola rimarrà come spazio centrale quando a fine Expo il padiglione Italia servirà per altre funzioni. Negli edifici del Cardo, cupole più leggere costruite principalmente in materiali lignei ospiteranno le diverse esposizioni. Queste cupole visibili... Così avete già capito tutto delle cupole. Avete capito che questo... <ride> eh? Va bene, questo eh, era, era un, il video che abbiamo presentato due anni e mezzo fa, no? Alla al concorso per il Padiglione Italia e, e siamo arrivati secondi, non l'abbiamo vinto, però avete visto che cosa volevamo fare con le cupole, volevamo che fossero uh, il nuovo esperimento, oltretutto ci sarebbe piaciuto che queste cupole doppie con uh, la parte di sopra anche potessero diventare costruite da, da collettivi di architetti, autocostruzioni. Eh, veramente fossero come un mondo di sperimentazione collettiva in quei luoghi dove nella Expo non c'era una grande determinazione quindi questo l'abbiamo proposto per il Padiglione Italia queste sono le immagini che vedete delle varie forme che abbiamo studiato al momento della, del concorso e poi piano piano dopo aver perso il concorso e essere arrivati i secondi abbiamo spiegato ad Expo questo questa idea, Expo ha pensato che poteva essere un'idea molto carina, molto simpatica e che avremmo potuto mettere molte cupole di queste intorno alla Lake Arena e, e, e quindi siamo, siamo partiti con questa possibilità. No? Invece di essere l'interno del Padiglione Italia, potevano diventare 
degli esterni per conto loro e potevano essere tutte molto, molto diverse, questa è, quella, è l'Italia però vedete quante possibilità diverse stavamo studiando. E in realtà poi con il Politecnico ci siamo messi eh, pazzamente a lavorare, anche col concorso del Padiglione Italia l'abbiamo fatto insieme al gruppo del Politecnico, con Emilio Pizzi, Matteo Ruta, eh, molti studenti che hanno avuto voglia eh, di, di, di mettersi a lavorare su questi temi e, e per Expo abbiamo messo la stessa energia, la stessa voglia di fare e la stessa eh, in, lo stesso entusiasmo un po' pazzo di dire andiamo avanti forse non c'è la possibilità di costruire però eh, noi proviamo a lavorare e abbiamo avuto infinite riunioni con, eh, con Expo per, eh, per cercare di rendere reali queste strutture abbiamo cercato fino all'ultimo di renderle anche costruite da collettivi di architetti questo a un certo momento eh, ci è stato indicato che sarebbe stato impossibile però le cose ci venivano indicate sempre poco a poco. Poi abbiamo sviluppato perlomeno otto tipi diversi di cupole lignee, erano cupole di legno con l'intenzione di poter essere costruite facilmente ma anche di poter essere smontate e rimontate in altri luoghi eh, d'Italia, no? per esempio un collettivo che venisse da un luogo poteva montarla nella Expo e poi smontarla e rimontarla nel proprio luogo di, di, di di vita per, per, per utilizzarlo propriamente e, e poi alla fine eh, naturalmente siamo arrivati a febbraio eh, eravamo un po' preoccupati abbiamo detto beh la Expo apre a maggio cosa succede e, e ci hanno detto effettivamente che le cupole erano state tutte cancellate che non c'era possibilità di costruirne neanche una soltanto oh, un gruppo eh, Copagri che poi si è chiamato Lovit ha deciso che non voleva mollare il proprio progetto che aveva conosciuto, aveva visto, gli piaceva la location, gli piaceva la maniera di costruirlo, gli piaceva che fosse una, uno esperimento in legno molto carino, anche molto per il futuro. Siccome anche loro sono in relazione con l'agricoltura e eh, in relazione a tutto questo mondo di cercare di fare qualcosa di, di nuovo e di speciale, hanno detto ci dispiace voi di Expo magari non lo costruite ma lo costruiamo noi e quindi ci siamo trovati con il nostro team del Politecnico ad appoggiare questi piccoli costruttori che credo che fino allora avessero fatto solo dei tetti spioventi eh, nel costruire queste geometrie che, che avete visto. Ne hanno scelta una in particolare, qui sempre ne vedete molte, ne passiamo molto velocemente, queste erano le varie cupole che avevamo a disposizione e, e, e questa è la cupola che Lovit poi ha scelto per il proprio padiglione, una cupola doppia che dava la possibilità di avere due spazi, una, una, una posizione speciale di fianco alla Lake Arena. E io non so, volete, Matteo, volete venire a raccontare qualche cosa? Ma sì? No, perché io eh, niente, l'ho già raccontato, sono già fuori tempo massimo e sono molto felice di aver fatto questa esperienza che è stata un'esperienza eh, veramente fantastica, di collaborazione, bellissima, eh, dove la risoluzione dei problemi è stata fatta molto velocemente con eh, da parte di tutti noi un desiderio di riuscire ad arrivare fino al finale quindi capirsi, capirsi con i clienti, con le loro difficoltà, con le loro paure eh, lo strutturista Francesco Iorio veramente eh, bravissimo che ci ha sempre rassicurato e rassicurato tutti e, e l'equipe eh, che è sempre stato presente e che, e che ha reso possibile che queste cupole poi si siano costruite on site adesso le vediamo qui di fianco all'albero della vita che sembra un fratellino e, e qui ecco le sorelline piccole che sono le cupolette eh, di Lovit Copagri con i momenti della costruzione di questo, di questo padiglione che è rimasto come uno degli esperimenti che dallo studio poi sono riusciti a rendersi reali in, in, in un site. Eh, 
qui di fianco al padiglione Italia, di fianco al padiglione Vanche, costruendosi, crescendo piano piano in pochi mesi, perché veramente poi da quando abbiamo iniziato a costruire in marzo, 45 giorni in tutto e non siamo arrivati neanche tanto tardi, forse una settimana, <ride> ma perché veramente era, era una situazione speciale, no? avrebbe dovuto essere stato costruito direttamente da Expo. Questi sono i nodi, eh, i nodi che grazie Francesco Iorio a essere stato capace di, di costruirli, perché veramente hanno una geometria, una geometria complicata, la maniera di, di unirli e la geometria che si va piano piano richiudendo formando uno, due, spazi, due spazi gemelli che però naturalmente non sono ancora abitabili una copertura di TFT doveva, doveva entrare nel, nell'interno poi abbiamo ribassato naturalmente eh, nella qualità perché anche nella disponibilità dei materiali non c'era molto da scegliere Avevamo, avevamo appunto pochi giorni a disposizione per avere i materiali in, in luogo ed ecco questo è il tessuto interno che entra e che rende impermeabile questo spazio io credo di avere troppe fotografie qui non ho avuto il tempo di selezionarle siamo andati in site a fotografare quasi ogni mese andiamo velocemente a vedere le finite ecco qui Andiamole a vedere finite, vediamo se arrivano, tra poco, tra poco, qui ancora sono in costruzione, qui sono quasi finite, ecco sono finite, sono finite, qui c'è la porta che si apre così, una mucca che hanno messo l'ovid, l'interno dove si vendono i gelati, le pizze, cose meravigliose, e il, la doppia struttura che rende queste cupole parte del paesaggio della Lake Arena.